確かにあの時、奴は私を制した。その行為が時間跳躍に反映したのかもしれない。Yep, I'm remaking this review similar to my Flashpoint video essay. The situation with the Western comic book industry has not changed for the better since I made the original video, as Tom King's Batman and Catwoman miniseries has reached that point where the entire ship has died on me, and Scott Snyder's Dark Knight's death metal just enabled a bunch of fanfiction writers to run amok unorganized. And don't even get me started on how oversaturated Harley Quinn has become. That's what's going on on the DC side of things. And I don't even need to read what Marvel is doing to know how they are committing a slow suicide. Meanwhile, on the manga front, when I made the original video of this review, I had recently bought the ninth volume of My Hero Academia, and I'm currently up in the fifteenth volume, while having also bought One Punch Man's first five volumes. Manga has been beating Western comic books so much that it has basically started to cannibalize them as we now have a Deadpool manga and a Joker manga done over there in Japan. But this video will not be about them. Instead, I will now retell Batman Child of Dreams, written and drawn by Kia Asamiya, whom I will be calling Asamiya-san in this video. According to its still readable receipt, I have been the proud owner of this book since March 10, 2007. Batman Child of Dreams was originally created by Asamiya-san as normal manga series are done, as in it being read from right to left, but the English adaptation by Max Allan Collins has been flipped in reverse. It would have gone unnoticed if it wasn't for the fact that almost everyone in the book are left-handed, and then there is one other thing you can see early on when we get to it. And another thing changed in the adaptation process is this thing you can see in the picture of the book and my copy of My Hero Academia Volume 9, that I bought last year. The former is a big, A4-sized graphic novel, and the latter is what you'd expect manga books to be, an A5-sized pocketbook. This was slightly done for the Western localization, as the casual superhero comic book readers were not probably as adapted in reading manga as they are today. Maybe. Probably. I'm not really sure. Anyway, the story for Child of Dreams is quite big, and the graphic novel has 338 pages. Because of this I will be once again dividing this review into two videos, as Kodansa Magazine C did it with the original manga version. The first volume begins on Narita Ne International Airport in Japan, where a Japanese TV crew is getting on a plane to leave on assignment to Gotham, USA. This is Yuko Yagi, a TV interviewer, a Batman fan girl, and our heroine for the story, being yelled at by her producer, Nagai. Considering how they are about to leave on an international assignment to try to interview Batman, <laughs> good luck with that, and which happens to be their first big assignment that they do not want to mess up, it is quite understandable if he is under a lot of pressure. Yuko likely understands this as she is shown able to keep her head cool and focus on the job. Next, we get to hear how Asamiya-san sees Batman and the tone of the story. Two words, making one. A name he had taken many years ago when he was younger, when the Halloween melodrama had appealed to him. And yet, for all its childhood wrappings, the terror had taken root, and a young man's fantasy of striking fear became a grown man's mission. He had learned to be worse than the bad men he saw, more terrible than the villains who rose to meet his challenge. But somewhere along his tortured, if righteous path, the bat became dominant, of the two words making one. The man beneath the cape and cowl, overshadowed by the dark role he played on the darkest streets of Gotham. He was born Bruce Wayne, and yet now he spent his days pretending to be himself, ever since becoming a nightmare figment of his own imagination. Even as children of all ages, acted out their own Batman fantasies. Harmless fun, just as young Bruce Wayne had played cowboys and Indians, cops and robbers, Zorro and the evil captain. Kids today played Batman and the villain. But occasionally, an older child would feed on the urban legend of Gotham's Dark Knight. We are then shown an expository two-page spread about a hostage situation happening in Gotham. AKA, it's a normal Tuesday, and SWAT teams are taking positions as our TV crew is driving their van to Gotham from the airport while listening to the police radio. Nagai seems to have calmed down over the flight as he gives Yuko a necklace as a peace offering. 
although he claims that he is just delivering it as a gift from her uncle, who is sponsoring their trip. At the moment when she makes a peace with her producer, their van drives into the viewing distance of the bat signal, where our perspective shifts to Commissioner Gordon handling the hostage situation and learns who is the cause. And here is Two-Face card on the wrong side of his body as the result of the manga's localization. Listening to the police radio, Nagai leads his TV crew to the location where Two-Face is holding the hostages, meaning to hide in a good spot so they can get footage of the situation, and hopefully of Batman once he arrives to confront Two-Face. Unfortunately, Harvey is able to hear them on the other side of the door, and adds them to his group of hostages. As they are a TV crew, Harvey keeps them alive long enough so he can talk to their cameras to make a speech about the equality of fate and the reason why he is going to flip his coin on Yuko's fate first. While this is happening, we also get a glimpse of how informed Yuko is about Batman and his villains, as she notes that Harvey Dent should be locked in Arkham at the moment, and when trying to reason with Dent, Harvey claims that that name does not mean anything to him. As the coin begins to descend, a batarang throws it off its course as Batman enters the scene. In the delicate situation where Two-Face takes Hugo into a gunpoint, Batman begins their confrontation by questioning the entire situation, especially the fact that taking hostages is against his modus operandi, and that Two-Face is working alone without a crew accompanying him, distracting him with questions and making Harvey look at which side his coin landed. Batman manages to get Yuko out of Two-Face's grips, and begins to fight him, to a point where Two-Face breaks down crying. Batman cops Two-Face and delivers him to GCPD, while Harvey keeps acting out of character. Leaving the situation, Batman is then approached by Yuko and her crew trying to interview him, but Senpai refuses to notice her, apart from telling Yuko to take the mic and cameras off him. Commissioner Gordon manages to provide a distraction by taking the crew in as material witnesses as Batman makes his leave to the Batmobile, to Juko's reasonably professional leveled awe. At the GCPD, Commissioner Gordon scolds off Nagai and Yuko about their actions and suggests them to return to Japan with the footage they got from the hostage situation. While this is happening, Gordon gets a call from the coroner's office where Two-Face's body has been taken after he apparently began to decay into a mummified corpse. He shares this information with Yuko and Nagai, suggesting them to take it as the ending of their new story, a suggestion that Yuko protests to and refuses to take on, while Nagai, as her boss, promises to Gordon to do as he says. Batman arrives to the Batcave, having learned about Two-Face's apparent demise on the way there, but a quick review over the Batcomputer reveals that Harvey Dent is still alive and locked in Arkham, meaning that the deceased Two-Face was an imposter and likely was not the last one to come. Then Bruce remembers how Yuko had made the attempt to reason with the fake Two-Face, with good intel to recognize he was not the original, and so Senpai leaves to get a better look at her at the hotel Yuko is staying in. And a good thing he is, because Yuko is doing something very, very stupid. Walking around Gotham at night, alone by herself, which goes about as well as you can imagine. Luckily now that Senpai has taken a notice at her, Bruce Wayne's limousine happens to drive by when Yuko is about to get mucked, and or worse, and she joins in with the much better company of the billionaire playboy. As Bruce Wayne, Batman manages to get a better first impression with Yuko, talk to her about her journalistic goals in Gotham, and how she wishes to get an interview out of Batman. Bruce leaves Yuko at her hotel, while also using his charms to ask her out, so he can keep tabs on her during her stay in Gotham. Yuko likes the idea of seeing the handsome billionaire again, and I approve of this ship. The next morning at breakfast, Nagai informs Yuko that the arrangement for them to return to Japan have been made, but Yuko is able to put her foot down and buy herself 24 hours to shoot some B-roll footage and do some research. And believe me, good thing they do because more imposters of Batman's rogues gallery start appearing the next night. A fake penguin blows up a church, a fake Riddler tries to rob a jewelry store, and they both end up dead, just like the fake Two-Face did. Yuko and Nagai are not far behind filming, and covering as Batman apprehends the imposters, much to Commissioner Gordon's annoyance, 
and Nagai congratulates Yuko in talking them to stay. As more incidents occur, the autopsies reveal the cause of death being an overdose from an unrecognizable design drug, which is dubbed as Fanatic. Fanatic is analyzed enough to recognize that it can be used to turn the addicts using it into imposter villains, who then eventually die when the effect wears off. What is more worrying is that incident by incident, the variation of Fanatic being used by different imposter villains is made from a stronger form than the previous one, meaning that whoever is making it is a powerful new player, making the police, Batman and Yuko's news crew to wonder if it is being done locally or imported by someone private. In the middle of all this, Bruce Wayne invites Yuko to a dinner at the Wayne Manor, which piques Nagai's interest. At their date, Bruce and Yuko get to talk more about her fangirling over Batman, which has brought her and her TV crew to Gotham. And look at these visuals with this pacing of the conversation. They do not draw comics in the West like this anymore. Bruce and Yuko's dinner date goes through with natural speed, with the first page establishing where they are having dinner. The second page continues with the same scene, and the third and fourth pages show them having moved to a balcony observing the night skyline. And Yuko is drawn beautifully to show how happy she is talking about her two dreams having converged, as she has managed to get to do her job about the subject that she is most passionate about, while Bruce uses gentle discipline to bring her back to reality. The two almost have a moment worth shipping together here, before suddenly the bat signal appears on the sky, forcing them to take separate cars to where things are happening. This time it is the Joker, or A Joker, who is making a scene, giving away pills that could be lethal when consumed, or otherwise when come into contact with. Hmm. Yuko calls the Joker a nightmare in flesh. In the original video, I said that the Batman who laughs could have been a more accurate comparison, but that was before Scott Snyder turned him into the darkest knight in Dark Knight's death metal, and ruined the psychological horror appeal he used to have. Batman arrives to the scene at this Joker's delight, and is quickly ready to question him about his motives, as well as the drugs spread under their feet. This Joker had admits them to be a variation of Fanatic, which he himself has used, admitting to not being the real Joker, and that he has a bomb under the pile of pills. Batman attempts to disarm this Joker from the detonator, which ends up being a GREAT BIG phony. And this Joker detonates his bomb with the real one in a fake tool. The explosion causes the fanatic pills to spread out into the observing public, practically giving more people the opportunity to use it and become imposter villains, with this Joker disappearing in the commotion. Only 90% of the pills are recovered, with the 10% presenting a major health problem to Gotham, and the imposter Joker is not recovered as a corpse just yet. The readers are given a glimpse of the fake still alive with a shadowy figure, who gives him a picture of Yuko. Into his own research on Fanatic, Batman is delivered via Commissioner Gordon an invitation from Arkham Asylum, with the real Joker asking him to meet him. And this is the only scene in the entire story where an actual original Batman villain makes an appearance. Compared to the imposter villain, the Joker is portrayed more in character, not happy about his image being taken by someone else, but is still amused at getting to play Hannibal Lecter to Batman's Clarice. The Joker reveals that his contacts have confirmed that Fanatic is not being made by a local syndicates in Gotham, making it a very sophisticated import made by someone big on the outside. Batman then reveals that the pills spread by the imposter Joker were from an advanced form than the one used by the previous imposters, and that no new mummified corpse have shown up at the morgue. Learning that his imposter is still out there, the Joker begs Batman to kill the plagiarist, to which Batman gives no promises as he leaves. Because of his unexpected invite to Arkham, Bruce Wayne was forced to cancel an another date with Yuko, who did not unfortunately get the message. She gets into a car, and is taken by an unknown driver. With the Joker's given information about Fnatic being imported to Gotham, Batman stakes out at the docks, where he hears a familiar laughter coming from a yacht parked near the bridge. Entering the yacht easily, Batman discovers the imposter Joker inside, with the unconscious Yuko at his mercy under a small bottle of acid. Batman tells the imposter about having just seen the original, real Joker, who has asked him to kill the imposter. The imposter doesn't care, calling the imposter an ex-Joker, and being himself the new improved Joker, 
which causes Batman to call the imposter an insane child. Then the imposter makes a completely left field demand, saying he will let Yuko go free in exchange for Batman removing his clothes, claiming not to be interested in that kind of fun. Batman uses the opportunity by starting with his utility belt and shoots the acid bottle away from Yuko with the grappling gun, causing it to spill on the imposter's left side. With Yuko out of the harm's way, Batman gets serious in getting answers out of the imposter joker, just as he begins to decay like the previous imposters, and the yacht begins to move by itself. The imposter's final words are nonsense, out of which I only managed to pick up for the script to summarize it is that the sick bastard wanted to be the Joker, and the same kind man who gave him fanatic to live out his dream also provided monetary compensation for his parents. As the imposter is dying happily, Batman notices a security camera filming them, and the imposter dies without telling who his benefactor is. Letting go of the corpse, Batman turns to the camera and asks who the Watcher is, getting the answer through the intercom as <laughs> Batman does not have the time to be confused by the answer he is given, as his and Yuko's lives are once again in danger, as the yacht is revealed to be a death trap. Getting back on the deck, Batman uses the only shot he has on grappling himself and Yuko of the speeding yacht before it explodes after them. Now on the clear, Batman turns his attention on Yuko's unexpected appearance on the yacht, and the possibility that her involvement in the case not being a coincidence, and takes her to the Batcave, so he can question her once she has woken up. Yuko wakes up later in a rather comfortable looking bed inside the Batcave. I know the Batcave is equipped with prisoner holding cells, so bedrooms for witness protection shouldn't be a stretch. Batman allows Yuko to get somewhat comfortable with her surroundings, up to the point where she begins to take pictures with her pen camera, which he tells her to have been damaged during the hostage situation she ended up sleeping through. Hearing this does not scare Yuko, however, as she immediately goes to the reporter mode to try get an interview, which Batman is able to tone down by reaching out to her survivor instinct. Here it is revealed to us that the necklace that Yuko is wearing has a camera on it, camera and a satellite link that matched to give her location on the property owned by Bruce Wayne to an elusive man who calls instructions to another shadowy figure in Gotham, who opens a case with a hypodermic needle and some black clothes. And this is where I'm moving the original video spoiler alert for the rest of volume 1. If you want to learn what happens next on your own by reading the manga and not get spoiled, this is the time code where the summarization of the story is over, and I'll give my final revised thoughts. Batman briefs Yuko in on about the events on the yacht, while driving her back to Gotham in the Batmobile. While they speak about the fanatic and the imposter villains, the shadowy figure is shown putting on a Batman costume, while also taking the drug. And as Batman reaches the point about the voice on the yacht calling himself to his biggest fan, the headlights of the Batmobile reveal another Batman standing in the middle of the road, calling out an imposter to get out of his car. As Batman gets out of the Batmobile to approach the man on the road, his first observation is that the features revealed in the mask's mouth hole are not the same as his own, meaning that the other Batman is just someone wearing the costume, and not an another drug-induced doppelganger. When he does address the other Batman and gets him to speak, Batman's second observation is that the imposter has a Japanese accent, one that he is able to recognize. Also, when countering an attack, Batman manages to cut off the right ear from the imposter's mask, and so make it easier to differentiate which Batman is which. As the two Batmen engage in combat, Batman keeps asking who the one-eared Batman is working for, with the latter talking down the original and claiming to be the better, new and improved Batman. To Red Hood fans, this manga came out before Jason Todd returned from the dead in 2005's Under the Red Hood storyline and the fight between the two Batmen is not as evenly matched as you might think. Batman recognizes that the one-eared Batman is pumped full of something, and has strength way beyond his reasonable human levels. Because of this, he essentially needs to hold on against the imposter, until the effects of his drugs wear off, which is revealed to be what the elusive man wants, as the reader is shown that the imposter Batman's cowl has sensors, recording the real Batman's fighting techniques. 
Eventually the mortal combat between these two Batman leads the, from the road to the graveyard nearby, where the original Batman is able to use his own skills and abilities to disarm the one-eared Batman of his weapons, distract him, and keep the imposter in a kind of stun-locked state, until he falls down and does not have the strength to get back up anymore, still refusing to give up who he is working for. Yuko arrives at the scene, having followed them from the Batmobile, and Batman is able to tell through her to the readers how the one-eared imposter is different from the previous imposter villains. ジョーカーだけじゃない。悪党どもをまとめて21世紀に戻さなきゃ。しかし、それには武器が最初から知っていたら、さすがだな。動くのが大切なものじゃないんですか。騎士の横暴に苦しめられている人たちが、バットマン
I swear that until my Yeah, yeah, what Superman said about dreams at the end of the VS Elite movie is true. But the dreams also need to be balanced with the truth and ideals of the world we live in. Truth of what is possible, aka the reality, and ideals, aka what pushes us forward. If you can balance your dreams with those two factors, then your dreams can come true. But if not, then stop living in a fantasy world and WAKE THE FUCK UP! The character of Yuko is provided as the perfect counterbalance to these imposter villains. On her first date with Bruce Wayne, she tells him about her dream of meeting Batman, and through her job as a news anchor, wishes to do an interview with him, a feat that would boost her career. Bruce then points out that she has her news story written in her head, which Yuko does reply by acknowledging that she is sounding like a fan club newsletter. Bruce calls Yuko's insight as the first step of living in the adult world, with the next step being thinking and acting as a real reporter, as the cold, hard, even deadly reality has no room for dreams. Yuko ends up learning this the hard way when she finally gets to actually meet Batman in the spoiler section. Without spoiling any details, while her personal dream of meeting Batman comes true, her professional dream ends up dying as the price and it completely destroys her spiritually, the same way how the imposter villains die with decay and mummification. Bruce coming to see Yuko off as she leaves to return home is what causes her to smile again, and when I go to volume 2, we then see her getting back up in rebuilding her career and moving on with her life. With this team in the story, Asamiya-san also managed to make Child of Dreams worth rereading instead of just a manga turned western comic story about Batman that you can read through once and not think about it anymore when moving on to other stuff. Asamiya-san's art is also quite beautiful in a flawed way. The black and white coloring is retained from the manga, and it suits the story while the style is balanced enough between realistic and cartoon-like manga. I do have a minor pet peeve with how some of the characters have their noses drawn though, especially when they are drawn from the side, where they look too pointy or have spread too far ahead. But this is mostly noticed just when you pick up the book and eventually get used to it while reading. Otherwise the manga style is realistically balanced enough to have light-hearted moments when needed, like with Yugo's date with Bruce, while also having serious and menacing moments. This is why I would have loved to see Child of Dreams adapted into an anime, rather than that Batman Ninja movie we got in 2018. But but when it comes to the portrayal of characters pre-existing the manga, Asamiya-san has been able to write them accurately enough. Batman's approach, for example, to the imposter villains might seem strange at first sight, but it can be excused with him noticing them acting out of character, and that influences how he approaches the people he knows not to be his regular villains. Commissioner Gordon in his scenes is written and drawn as he has always been, but he is used only as much as needed, and the little he is used keeps him in character. Harvey Bullock also has a cameo talking about the fanatic with Gordon, but it is only for one page, so accuracy isn't needed for the short exchange in dialogue. When it comes to the Joker's Arkham cameo, his motivations are understandable in not being pleased with his image being observed, and getting to play Hannibal Lecter with Batman standing in for Clarice, as something he would get some pleasure out of while giving Batman information he needs to deal with his imposter. For him, it's a win-win situation. Finally, there is Alfred who looks more like Alfred Beagle or Hercule Poirot than Alfred Pennyworth as he is drawn. But otherwise the faithful butler is who we know and love in his supporting role. Well done, Asamiya-san. This manga has aged surprisingly well when it comes to the characterizations and the story progression. They really don't write Batman comics like this anymore. And now it's time to ask you to like the video, comment your thoughts down, share the video to those who deem interested on it, and subscribe what is coming next. And may your heart be your guiding key.